He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. This is more starch reserve, slow to grow, as that is nice and fresh, canes laid out, will give you really uh, vibrant profile, whereas this is sort of the grounded, really uh, make it grow quite steadily right through, and so that by the end of it, what you get is really really narrow bandwidth of maturity of the grapes, which will give you a really consistent flavor profile right through. It's coming up to a busy season here at Blenheim's Villa Maria Estate. I'm here to meet Aman Chofin, who's telling me about the different blocks they've been cultivating. This is Voices. My name is Kadamri Raghukumar. On today's episode, I'm talking to two people from two different parts of the world who decided to call New Zealand home, chasing what they love, winemaking. Aman's the vineyard manager and has lived in Blenheim for over two decades. New Zealand's wine industry has over the years attracted huge amounts of global interest, from people wanting to study bitter culture to scoping job opportunities in the industry. That's pretty much what brought Aman here from the Himalayas in India. So wine clearly isn't where it all began for him. You've spent 10 years working on a tea estate. Yeah, <laughs> that's from another life. <laughs> uh, Talking to my younger self, it looks like it. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> uh, family's farmers up in the Himalayas, and so joined in '95 April, and uh, never looked back from there. It is a way of life. And if you know us in India, tea is life. Aman's relationship with it, though, crosses several borders. Yeah, so my ancestors were from China, and they were brought in by the Britishers to plant tea in different parts of India. And then, of course, one was the uh, Himalayas up there, um, Pori Gurwal. And probably that fascination of tea was there with me as well. I said, what made them leave their home country to come and you know, start off a new uh, journey? Which part of your family was from China? Dad's side. So five generations, roughly. That was really uh, sort of what interested me in tea as well. And when I joined tea, it was like, ah, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> Beautiful, you know, 800 hectares of plantations. What's tea estate culture like in that part of India? Ah, that's hard to put in sentence. (laughs) It's a way of life, basically. Uh, Worked hard, played hard, you know, access to all games. That was big for me as well. There's something on just sitting on a desk, but out in the open doing stuff. You know, it's a close-knit community. And, but then with entertainment and all, you had clubs that you attended and it was necessary to go Wednesdays and Fridays. Mm, you managing workers, uh, there's a lot of labor management involved, but uh, production of tea, of course, that is the biggest uh, purpose. Uh, you have field where you grow the tea and it's daily, pick daily. And then uh, there's the processing aspect of it, which you, again you process daily what you pluck. So it's a it's a rhythm for year round. Aman's hometown is called Podi Gadwal and sits in the lower Himalayas in Uttarakhand, which you'll find somewhere north of Delhi. It was around here that experimental tea planting was started by the East India Company sometime in the 1850s. But the other thing that this area is known for, Pori Gadwal and its surrounding Kumaon region, is that it's been the historic setting for some classic British Indian novels based around the rich wildlife there, big cats included. You know, you'll have elephants uh, roaming around at night, you'll have leopards <laughs> shooting through, you know, pythons, name it. So it is very different. What are some of your favorite memories growing growing up in that part of India, you know, on a tea estate like that? Just the sereneness, you know. You've done your day's job and you've had your lunch and dinner and just sit outside and just enjoy what's there, night sky, and sounds that come from the forest, you know, the peace. Uh, really good friends, I think so. You know, you're just a handful that used to be on a tea estate, five families, four families. But that was enough to keep each other <laughs> going. Uh, yeah. Do you miss it? Yeah, yeah. I'd be lying if I say no. But, you know, you move on, different phase of life, different time of life. And uh, that was then, this is now. 
So I think so I've had best of both worlds, so can't complain. So that was then and this is now. Aman's quite a stoic, it turns out. I first met him about 15 years ago when he managed a biodynamic vineyard, Saracen, in Blenheim. Biodynamic farming has always been quite close to Aman's heart, considering its many parallels with traditional farming techniques in India. But right now, we're driving through the blocks around Villa Maria. So where are we at now? What so is this? So this is Finlayson, um, fully organic. Eight and a half hectares of uh, Pinot Noir. Just to sort of put it into perspective, this sort of sits in one of the southern valleys, which is, you know, clay. That is the basis of this whole valley that we have out here. Back in the office, we're staring at a whiteboard which has his team members' names and all the blocks and tasks he's meant to manage today. And of course, there's got to be tea. Good. You still like your morning chai? Oh, yes. <laughs> has to be good tea. <laughs> you know, one, right. one cup of tea as opposed to like India, you'd have probably 10 tea, cup of teas in the day. <laughs> but here it's like two, three. But then again, those two, three need to be, you know hit the pellet. Yeah, you <laughs> have to right. be of a certain standard. <laughs> yeah. Great. So when you look back at your life, you know, growing up on a tea estate in a farming family in India, and now you're here in Blenheim, managing vineyards at Villa Maria, what are some of the things that you see as similar? I think so the commonalities is human nature is the same. Human needs are the same. Farming is the same. And so, I mean, you use more technology out here, you're using more machinery out here. That was probably the biggest difference, whereas that was full-on manual task. Any and everything was done by hand. And that was probably one of the reasons for keeping everybody employed out there. So, I mean, that's a massive social factor involved in that. Love of the land, the care for the land, care for the people that take care of the land. You know, that is really important. Uh, they used to say the farmer is the best fertilizer for the land. The way that you tend to the land is how your land will respond. So I think so that is a really big ethos. So no matter how you're farming, that attachment, you know, that care, that passion for the land and what grows on it. Aman's got a big day ahead, but I guess he strikes a decent balance between fine wine and great chai. Across in the North Island in Hawke's Bay, another international import into the industry, Guillaume Thomas, is starting out his morning. He's French and his love for wine, amongst other things, brought him to this part of the world. In the vineyard this morning, beautiful sunshine. It's really nice to be surrounded by um, all these sounds. We love the birds 10 months of the year and not so much around harvest time, but we deal with that, um, with protecting the grapes. But yeah, no, otherwise it's a really nice um, environment to be surrounded by them. Games from near the town Nantes and studied winemaking in Bordeaux. He and his partner Esther run Maison Noir Wines, where Guillaume is the winemaker. Like Aman, working outdoors in New Zealand was also one of the huge draw cards for Guillaume to come here. My family didn't have a background in uh, winemaking or viticulture, but uh, I was in a little hamlet that was surrounded by vineyards. And so uh, in my hamlet, there was a winemaker and his son was the same age as me. So, so I grew up uh, uh, with him and was a very good friend with him. Uh, so, so got introduced to this sort of wine world uh, relatively um, uh, young. Uh, the interest for me was all, all the viticulture side is really this link with nature. Uh, and in the wine winery, you've got... Um, all the magic happening, so so, but that's also very related to to science and technology. Uh, so, so that's a world that uh, combines a lot of uh, different um, things that I do enjoy. Always in the wine industry, it's very very easy um, to travel around the world because there's always a requirement for um, extra staff um, during the harvest and vinification time. So, so you can either get a, a part-time positions um, uh, or, or, uh, yeah, um, in the, the cellar or in the vineyards. In 2006, I came in uh, for one of these uh, OEs uh, in New Zealand and uh, ended up in Hawke's Bay. Uh, and, and that's where I met my wife, my future wife. So, so uh, that, that's sort of the call of, <laughs> of love in some ways that, uh, that brought me uh, to, to, to New Zealand. When you compare what you've experienced in France to New Zealand, 
as a professional in the wine industry, what what were some of the things that you found really challenging to um, to adjust to? Um, in terms of uh, winemaking, I think that uh, New Zealand is, pr- is probably the uh, new world country closest to France in terms of uh, climate and wine styles. This uh, was relatively easy to adapt for me. Uh, what was slightly different is that within a region like Hawke's Bay, um, there were so many different uh, wine styles being made. And that's where you realize that uh, New Zealand has got a, a huge amount of microclimate. So even within the region, you can have very, very different uh, wine style being produced. So that was a little harder to to um, to adjust at, at the start, but that's also great opportunities when you're a winemaker because you can make all these different styles uh, within the same regions, uh, getting grapes from different uh, areas. In terms of business, and especially in France, it's uh, really generational. So you, you sort of pass on uh, your exploitation from uh, father to, to, to son and daughters and, and so on. In New Zealand, I think it's it's a lot more recent industry. So it, it brought a lot more um, uh, capitals from different investors and so on, and a lot more marketing orientated. Within New Zealand, there is a really a lot of uh, great wines uh, that are being produced and some of them are only available on the domestic market. Uh, and the reason why is that there's a lot of uh, small producers like me uh, who probably don't have the capacity to go to export. There is this uh, big wineries that are going to, to, to go flat out exporting and, and do a great job to to get that great image of New Zealand abroad. These um, exciting things happening uh, within uh, each, each region in New Zealand and Hawke's Bay is certainly very exciting for that. New Zealand is now one of the most export-focused wine industries in the world, with nearly 90% of our wines being exported. The 2023 vintage produced the third highest yield in the past decade. But for growers in Hawke's Bay, things haven't been the easiest since Cyclone Gabriel earlier this year. But Guillaume's optimistic for his region with summer coming around. Yeah, I, I guess the cyclone impacted everyone. Uh, fortunately, we were not um, badly hit. Uh, so, so the sheer amount of water was just uh, uh, very, very scary, of course. But uh, And the wind too with the cyclone. It was just the... the the sheer core of devastation throughout the regions, uh, people that you know that have lost everything and so on. And that was really, really tough to, to take mentally. Uh, so, so, yeah, very, very hard to, to manage uh, in a year like uh, last year. Uh, we're really um, looking forward to, to, to welcome people again uh, with a lot of different um, festivals and, and so, stuff like that, uh, uh, events uh, happening. So, so, so yeah, we, we really hope that we'd see uh, uh, some of the local tourists coming uh, again. Aman Chofin talking to me in Blenheim and Guillaume Thomas talking to me from Hawke's Bay. Every week I bring you stories from across the country with people from across the world who live here. You can follow Voices on all your favourite podcast platforms from Apple, iHeartRadio to Spotify. Today's episode was mixed by Rangi Poik and I'm Kadambri Raghukumar. <laughs>